Tonight, Vice President Dr. Bamiya breaks his silence on Ghana's return to the IMF, accusing the SWA Mahama administration of being responsible for the nation's return to the Bretton Woods Institution. We will interrogate his claims after this break. You welcome back. My name is Raymond Dalqua, and tonight Vice President Dr. Mahmoud Bamiya says part of Ghana's current economic challenges can be blamed on the previous government. In a speech at the Accra Business School, the Vice President listed what he described as the quadruple whammy. I've heard double whammy, not this one, but quadruple whammy. He says the current government faces excess capacity payments, banking sector crisis, and the ones we've been hearing up to now, COVID-19 and the Russia-Ukraine war. But Dr. Palmier says the excess capacity payments and the banking sector crisis were inherited from the Eswa Mahama administration. Let's listen to him as he delivered that speech earlier today. Balance of payment support was needed to bridge this financing gap, stabilize the economy, and create the space to implement structural reforms and restore debt sustainability. And this is really the reason why Ghana had to go to the IMF. I should again note that Ghana has been hit with a quadruple one, a quadruple one. The energy sector excess capacity payments, banking sector cleanup, COVID-19, and the Russia-Ukraine war. We have been uh, hit by this quadruple one. If you, and I say again that if you take out the fiscal impact of this quadruple whammy, Ghana will not be going to the IMF for support because our fiscal and debt and balance of payments outlook would be sustainable. Of the four factors, COVID-19 and the Russia-Ukraine war were external, and the other two, the banking sector cleanup and the excess capacity payments, were the result of policies of the previous government. Today, all over the world, fuel prices are rising in virtually every country. Food prices are rising, inflation is high, it's at a high for many years. Currencies are falling in value, fiscal deficits are rising, debt levels are increasing. This is happening globally, and this tells us that what we are dealing with is a global phenomenon. Let me give you an analogy to make my point. If you ask a carpenter to roof your house, and he roofs this house, and suddenly the roof collapses without any rainfall or wind, suddenly you have a collapse of the roof. Will you not blame the carpenter who did the roofing? Will you not blame the carpenter? But if the carpenter roofs your house and the roof collapses because there's a tornado and a storm which has blown away roofs and windows and walls of many houses, will you blame the carpenter? <laughs> Let us understand the context. <laughs> Let us understand the context. In one situation, you will definitely blame the carpenter. In another situation, you will blame the tornado. Dr. Baumia, they're putting in perspective the realities that's causing the, the what has been termed as the, the quadruple whammy. Now, we put that also in proper perspective in studio with me now is a professor of finance at the University of Ghana Business School. Now, Elik Plim Agbloyo is a man who has designed with artificial intelligence and can tell you which countries are going to the IMF. That's what he's done. He's designed a very wonderful system that can tell you which countries are going to the IMF. We would help us understand what's really happening in the country. Also joining us via Zoom from the USA is a man on whose doorstep the blame was launched nicely because he was the finance minister in the SWAL Mahama administration. The Honorable Sek Tepe joins me now. You're welcome, sir, to up front. I hope you are doing well. I'm doing pretty well. Thank you very much and uh, good evening um, in Ghana to your listeners. Prof, I hope you are well too. Viewers. I'm also doing well and good evening to you on this. <coughs> Brilliant. Now, I'll come to you on this one, but let me get it and put this in perspective. Honorable Secretary, 
the, the, the vice president who chairs the economic management team has been explaining up until now, many of the Ghanaian government communication has been simply, it was COVID and then Ukraine-Russia war. That's what brought us where we are today. But he's put it in proper perspective. He says, no, it's not only these two. There are four. First, excess payments in the energy sector. Two, banking sector cleanup. They can add the other two that has nothing to do with us. He's also pushed it a little bit further and said, COVID and Russia, they are external to us. But the banking sector cleanup and also the excess payments were surely your own doing. You, the previous government, brought it upon us and they were cleaning your mess. These are the reasons why we are at the IMF. Do you have counter evidence to suggest that this is not the case? The quadruple whammy is not the cause of our current situation. Certainly. Let's start with uh, Esla. And if you permit me, and I hope my technology is as good as the professor's, or at least. <laughs> uh, let me share with you. Um, could you ask the host to enable my sharing screen, please? But let me, let me say that the banking sector, um, why should we wait for, for, the, for me to be allowed to share? The banking sector, as well as energy sector, um, I wonder, sorry, I was traveling overnight, so I didn't listen uh, to the speech, but I've read SF's uh, thanks for the replay. There was no mention of ESLA from when I joined. And I think that also puts things in proper perspective for us. Uh, you recall, you know, that before we left office, uh, we went to parliament in 2015, you know, on ESLA, um, a proposal that would impose levies of three to five years. As we speak, it has been extended by the current government to 10 years, and the rates have been increased, despite calling it a nuisance, you know, tax. Furthermore, you recall that before we left office in 2016, as the ESLA flows started to come in, we had refinanced VRA's debts of 2.2 billion, the very debts that the vice president was talking about. We had injected 500 million into the banks because VRA had actually borrowed you know, from the banks. And that is a linkage between the energy sector debt and the banking sector debt and the collapse of the banks. We had, we were, we had provisions to pay that through uh, what you call the bad, you know, bad bank approach where uh, government would have settled most of this, including especially the energy sector and road so what we had was tripartite between government, the contractors, VRA, and the Bankers Association. And we started paying off this. Now, this is liquid cash that was flowing for the purpose of this, for, for the purpose of this repayment. And we had set up an escrow regime. What the vice president did not mention, thank you very much for, what the vice president did not mention is, a, is the fact that it is this very uh, facility that was, you know, collateralized. Uh, I hope that my sharing, my screen is showing. Yeah, I can see something like that, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what I'm going to show here is that this is April 21st, 2017. Please note, not 2016. 2017. By April 2016, we had certain negotiations. And so this is the government, the current government assuring the uh, IMF, the World Bank at the spring meetings, as well as investors who were there and the Ghanaian public, that the government would issue 15 year bond to clear the 2.4 billion energy debt. Now, let me, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but let me read just a couple of paragraphs. Government has announced to issue 15 year bond to settle all outstanding debts in the energy sector. All outstanding debts in the energy sector. 
The move is also aimed at improving the financial strength of state-owned enterprises in the energy sector and to make them competitive. Listen, Vice President Dr. Mahmoud Baumia disclosed this when he addressed a session of the ongoing spring meetings in Washington. Mm. And this is what he said further. There is a $2.4 billion debt. So he acknowledged that the entire energy sector debt was 2.4, which was part of Islam. That is hanging over the neck of state-owned enterprises. What we are going to do is to issue a 15-year-long energy bond to deal with the debt. This is the beginning of collateralization for a cash flow, which me and you, when we buy fuel as Ghanaians today, are paying. Why collateralize something which was being put in an escrow to pay and clear this debt, and for which we have started, and I'll produce evidence to show that we have started, you know, to pay down the debt. Now we will have one bond, which will take off all those liabilities and government will service those bonds with the ESLA revenues. So you see the connection to ESLA. I'm quoting direct the vice president who was speaking today, and I'm sure did not mention this. Now, government debt hit $2.3 billion in 2016. True. But then it was a result of Dumso and others. A breakdown was given net debt to banks. So you, say, you see the linkage to the banks. Fuel suppliers, you see a linkage to IPPs, amounted to 1.3 billion. A further breakdown showed that the banks are owed 782 million US dollars, whilst fuel suppliers are owed 414 million US dollars. VRA also contributed 278 million dollars to the 440 million owed by suppliers while Tor contributed 162 million dollars in fact so there was a Tor element and there was a strategic stock element and please for the avoidance of doubt i am quoting you know the vice president who has acknowledged this in the interest of time i would refer you know your this is being recorded you can put it on your website for everybody now, what did we do? Debt restructuring. In August 2016, the XY NDC government, through the finance minister at the time, Yugusel, with all due respect to Ghanaians, restructured the debts owed by VRA. As a result, the interest rates for the city and dollar components were both renegotiated. Also, a payment plan was agreed the NDC government made three separate payments between August and December 2017 before, sorry, it should be 2016, that was a mistake. I am not producing this. I am quoting a report by the city FM rep in Washington at the time and was widely publicized. Now, if you permit me again uh, to go to my sharing screen, and I hope I get this right, um, the I I I I'll, I'll come to this point, but Mr. Techman, the the question I was asking, and you've taken us through what has been said about this same point previously. The question I was asking yes, but, is whether, but, but excuse me, if you if you permit me, no problem. Just just finish with that point. No problem at all. Yes, for the purpose, I'll just show. Mm -hmm. uh, quickly, two more slides. I'm not going to, I'll just summarize. I'm not going to take everybody through. Um, so we go to uh, this one, which tells you what we did. Apart from 500 million that was injected in, a rebate of 3.5% of gross debt. So we got a rebate from the bankers. An extension of the maturity of the city component, which means a longer period to pay. And we've been talking about three to five years, it was to be set up, right? Uh, so again, this was done on, of particular interest. We reduced, we managed to negotiate to reduce 
a 32% interest that VRE was paying to 22%. So this is what you call, you know, the, the haircut, you know, which again uh, came with it. Now, what is the status of ESLA today? This is the status of ESLA as published in the government's own ESLA report, which we had put in the law, must be published. I'm not going to go through everything. I've highlighted the energy, and there's a road element to it. The contractors, we had actually refinanced one billion before we left office, similarly to VRE. We had submitted a term sheet of 600 million led by Ezim, Afri Ezim, to pay the IPPs, whose debt, if you remember, was stated as 442, but plus other payments in the earlier slide. As we speak, ESLA has brought in 10 billion for energy, and ESLA is projected to bring in the last column, 23 billion, 23.5 billion Ghana cities. Why are we not mentioning? Why was this not used to settle the debt? Why was not this used to pay the depositors, pay the bank so that the depositors will be paid? This is, this, this is facts, you know, which is from the government's own, you know, uh, ESLA report. Now, let me just end the slide with one more fact. Um, Now this one shows you clearly Esla bond, the bond that the government did, won a Europe, Middle East, and Africa, that is EMEA prize, July 30th, 2018. Mm. The structure was so, yes, and it was received. So we are talking about, you know, and the promise that was made was that the Esla bond at the time was going to be, the process was going to be used to repeat what the vice president said, to pay off the energy sector debt and what was weighing on the banking sector. As we say in the law course, I rest my case, you know, before the good people of Ghana, they can Google, they can, you know, these are things which were widely reported. So if the vice president is reporting, you know, and still laying the blame, for something that he acknowledged. He acknowledged the existence of ESLA, which they called a, a nuisance tax. He acknowledged, you know, that, you know, it was bringing in revenue. He acknowledged that a bond was going to be issued, which has been issued, which is to collateralize, including even the VRA portion that we were paid. We are paid three installments. And today, because we are going to the end, he wants to shift the blame to the NDC. We in the NDC totally reject this. And what he should have done was, in all due respect, he's my vice president, project the ESLA revenues from the ESLA report to Ghanaians at that lecture. And if tell them what they did with it, project the ESLA bond that was issued and tell Ghanaians what was done with the money. Thank you very much. We can proceed. Now, okay, we are starting from that particular point, so we can actually take it one by one. The vice president said excess capacity charges. They spent $17 billion on that. You are saying that we are actually raking more money than the $17 billion and that we could have paid the $17 billion with ESLA funds. Is that what I get right from you? That's precisely what I'm saying. And if... The term sheet had been uh, uh, had materialized, then we would have gotten money to pay the IPPs, which is what you know has been dogging us. Sorry if I may stop the sharing so that you know you can see the screen. Mm. Yes, so it would have been even if the bond had been used, we would have settled because you know you are getting money upfront, and the money should have been used. To settle the debt. Why are we talking about the debt today? There is no dispute. They won the prize. Then this was never mentioned when they won the prize. Right? So um, no credit was given. Uh, this is similar to we leaving 250 million US dollars 
out of which the NPP used 200 million after we had paid down 336 million of the first sovereign bond. The 10th anniversary of that bond, which was issued in 2007, was October 4th, 2017. And on that particular day, the 200 million sitting in a sinking fund with one oil field, which with three oil fields is going to be zero from next year, was used you know, to refinance, sorry, to repay the balance of that bond. No mention. It was October. The budget was presented in November. No credit was given, you know, for that. My the other point, when COVID struck, we went to parliament to withdraw 250 million US dollars, you know, from the stabilization fund. That was money with the NPP, and the NDC accumulated with one oil field. We could have increased that easily with three oil fields to maybe 700, 800 million. So if you added all this together, that is how you win yourself of the IMF. We're talking about IMF. Ve so ve very well. Now, so this is about the excess capacity charges. You are saying excess that- Excess capacity, I'm saying that the IPPs would have been paid. And okay. then, okay, of course, then we would have utilized. There was a plan agreed with the World Bank for which reason they gave the partial the risk guarantee. If you remember, we did a partial risk guarantee. In fact, under the smart borrowing, that was the only major guarantee that the Mahama administration, you know, uh, issued for which it issued a sovereign bond. You know, just to digress a bit, we use airport tax to do Terminal 3. We use uh, port revenues to do. They are not on public debt. They have put it back on public debt because those funds were encumbered instead of using it. So, so I'm saying that under the arrangement with the World Bank, and indeed under the MCC arrangement, there was an agreement that much of these revenues that we're talking about would settle, you know, the, 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 the debt in order that to utilize. Now, there was also an agreement. We had two agreements. I shared that with you before, a letter written by Honorable Jinapo, you know, for us to restructure the IPP agreements by the way we signed only two IPPs, you know, we took them to parliament under PCOA, not under pay, uh, 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 take or pay. Mm. Now, that restructuring is still ongoing. Seven years is not being completed. We were going to do it before we, we left office under that auspices. It is under that structure that you had what you call the private sector participation, which became the PDS fiasco. So that is how the capacity was to be utilized. The excess capacity exists because we are unable to exploit the gas as was originally planned, you know, to flow all the way for the private sector participation in which, you know, the MCC, the Million Challenge Corporation, you know, was together with the World Bank to make sure that we position the government. So the negotiations was to, yes, there was to be excess capacity for a period of two years. And so as we speak today, we tell Phil Sankofa, we would have renegotiated those ones to come, you know, when the utilization came in. Remember when we were doing all this in 2016, Tell Phil and Sankofa, you know, had not come on board. Yeah. It, the, 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 the agreement, you know, the production agreement came, you know, close to the end of 2016, and this administration benefited from 70,000 average barrels of crude oil to nearly 200,000 barrels of oil okay. and in spite of all the support i can have the opportunity to speak about covid you know and all that there was a gap of about five percent and i can show you at that table you know which was calculated by the imf and web bank and repeated it's repeated in article article 4 of 2021 again your listeners can google it is there that there was a gap of about five percent before covid you are rejecting, sorry, you are rejecting the excess capacity charges. Um, you being blamed for that particular policy. and Absolutely, absolutely, because all that we are talking about from ESLA to PDS, you know, to PSP and everything was linked into an agreement leading to a, 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 a letter of credit which was to be supported actually by the process. Remember, VRA was paying the debt. Esla was okay. going to take it off. The foreign component was what was to support that letter of credit.
I should come out with the details. I get your point. Come how about how about the financial sector cleanup? It happened under you. The financial sector problems right from 2015, 2016. Talk about the I just spoke about the solution. I just spoke about the solution. Because remember the heaviest arrears that was put to the banks was from the energy sector, do so and all that, contractors. And I just said that we brought the Bankers Association 11, 13 banks to my office. That's where the negotiation took place, you know, with my then office, right? And we brought VR and we said we were not going to pay the money to Minister of Roads and Energy. We were not going to, so Minister of Roads, neither were we going to pay to VRA or to the, they brought the bankers from whom they had borrowed. And we did a deal with the, we, we did a deal with the banks. And that is what, you know, so the, the, the money went, instead of going to VRA, it went straight to the banks. And that was the beginning of the resolution. Evidence is there. I just posted it. But you didn't finish that, that resolution, obviously. Of course, obviously, yes, certainly, because Esla was flowing in gradually, if you understand. Mm. Esla was flowing in gradually. So in their haste, what they should have done was to use the Esla bond money to settle, to clear the arrest as the vice president promised in Washington. So you think we should have and spent we would... $25 billion on resolving banking crisis? He promised it. You know, that is what we said that we were going to collateral, we were going to settle that link to the energy and other government areas. Subsidy, remember, talk came in and everything. We were going to settle between three to five years. He said, they, they said they were going to rather collateralize and even accelerate that money. When you collateral, okay. what means that you take the money upfront. And when you take the money upfront, right, you settle your debt. And then the flow, which will take time to come, which is the Esla flow would have settled within three to five years. That is 2015 to 2020. We are in 2022 and we have increased the ESLA. We have extended it. We have collateralized and we have not utilized the money as a result of which even, even the subsidy element is was, not available. It's was, been used. Was the, vice president, are, was the vice president honest with the people? You are rejecting the point he's making in here. Was the vice president honest with the people about why we are where we are today. I have provided the evidence. The vice president and his office can contradict it if he didn't say that in Washington. And so, with all due respect, that question should go to the vice president, why he wasn't candid with Ghanaians when he made his presentation. And remember, this is not a new you know, issue. If you go to my Twitter handle, we have discussed this when he made this about two years ago. Brilliant. So that question, that question, I have provided the evidence and I have showed that, you know, the process started and I have showed what we wanted to do with respect to all the issues that it raised. So with all due respect, could you please, you know, do a follow-up with the vice president? I'll come president? to you. I'll come back to you. Please give me a second. Let me come in studio. Prof, yes. you have actually designed a way of getting us to know whether we're going to the IMF. Yeah. In the last, since 2016, we're in an IMF program. Yeah. We left in 2019, somewhere in April. Yeah. When was it obvious that we we're going to go back to the IMF? Okay, Raymond, thank you very much for, for the question. Okay, so just to let listeners understand what machine learning and artificial intelligence is about, it helps us to build predictive models. So mm -hmm. that's a model that I use to analyze for a set of global countries, countries that are likely to go to the IMF and those that are not likely to go to the IMF. So the data I used for was from 1992 all the way to 2021. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So in simple terms, the human brain works like a computer. Mm -hmm. Okay. So when we see that there are clouds in the sky, we know that it's going to rain. Yeah. It's the same thing that the predictive models do. That when they see certain factors that they know that, okay, this country is likely to go to the IMF or this country is not likely to go to the IMF. Again, it's using other applications like predicting who will get cancer, or who will not get cancer. Very well. So let's say cancer is going to the IMF. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and not getting cancer is not going to the IMF. Not going to the IMF. Okay. Okay. So that's that's the kind of analysis I did. Brilliant. So in twenty nineteen, yes. was it obvious we we're going to the IMF? Yes. So in twenty nineteen, so all the way from twenty fifteen to twenty twenty one, the model was predicting that Ghana was in quote sick 
organized life need to go to the IMF. Okay. Yeah. Even in 2019, yes, in when we had just left one IMF program, yeah. what was it that made us look like we we're going to the IMF in 2019? In 2019. Okay. So, first of all, there are a number of factors. Mm -hmm. and this include one, the level of debt. Okay. okay. Uh, two, the currency depreciation. Uh, three, the reserves that we have at the Bank of Ghana for the strength of the financial sector, and we all know the problems that we face in mm -hmm. the financial sector. Five, the level of interest rates, high lending rates. It's also a key factor that predicts if countries will go to the IMF. Uh, six, volatility in financial markets. Okay, so there's an index called the VIX index, which measures volatilities in financial markets. And when the index is very high, it means that there's a lot of uncertainty. So like during the COVID-19 crisis, we saw an increase in the index globally. So that's also a predictive factor. Again, interestingly, one of the factors that we noticed was natural resources. Okay, so countries that have more natural resources were more likely to go to the IMF. And that's like a paradox because okay, yeah. <laughs> you expect that countries that are receiving revenues from oil, gold, cocoa, etc., will not go to the IMF. So there's a phenomenon referred to as a natural resource case. Okay. Yes. Is it true that is the quadruple whammy that took us to the IMF? Uh, I will say that there are contributing factors, but that's not the entire story. Okay. okay. So even before, like I said, even before the COVID-19 crisis, the Ukraine war, the model was predicting that we we're going to go to the IMF. Ghana was sick, in essence. Mm -hmm. uh, the quadruple whammy is probably the approximate cost of death. Maybe that's okay. what the doctors will say. Mm. Okay. You may die and there will be an immediate cost of death, but there are other sicknesses in your body that are conditions that show that you are not, you are not healthy. What were these other factors? Okay. Which so are different them, from the ones yeah. that are being mentioned by yeah. the Vice President. Yeah. So our high interest rates, financial development. Uh, there are also social factors. Let me, let me mention some of the social factors. So one of them is Countries that had high levels of malaria, HIV, tuberculosis, uh, didn't have a lot of basic facilities for basic drinking water. But, so, but those are not financial issues. They are social they're issues. They're not economic <laughs> issues. <laughs> they are, in a way. Okay, yeah, so we spent because, a lot on that too. Is that why we are going to the IMF? No, we are not. You see, these are symptoms of countries that are sick. Okay, all right, okay. okay these are symptoms of countries that are sick. Uh, these are the countries that are likely to go to, to the IMF. So, you see the debate between the vice president yes. and the current, vi uh, what the, the former uh, finance, finance minister. minister. Yeah. Who is right? One yeah. says, we left you enough money to pay for this and systems mm -hmm. to deal with the uh, crisis you're talking about in the banking sector mm -hmm. and the energy sector excess capacities that we're talking about. Yeah. The other says, you are responsible for it because you created it and we didn't actually, we spent money to deal with these issues. That's why we are going to the IMF. Mm -hmm. Are both right or who is right? <laughs> now, be it's a political question. Yes. Uh, so, as an as an academic, mm -hmm. what I can tell you is that even before COVID nineteen, uh, Russian war, mm -hmm. there were indications that our economy wasn't strong. There are more immediate causes like the increase in the debt levels, and that's where Tepe came in and said that the Esla bond could have helped to pay down some of these debts. Okay, so the increase in the debt level, our credit downgrade mm -hmm. is also a key factor. Okay. Okay, when we're downgraded by the major credit rating agencies like Fitch, Standard & Poor's, and Moody's, it meant that our cost of borrowing had increased. And that closed our access to international capital markets. That's why we couldn't issue the euro bonds. And because we couldn't issue euro bonds, the options for us were limited. We had to go to the IMF to raise the money that we needed in the interim. So let me also get this point because I'm actually inviting into the conversation Dr. Boyne. He's a, he is a political marketing specialist. Mm -hmm. the, 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 because I want to move it beyond just the economics and get to appreciate yeah. what could have been said differently. Dr. Boyne, welcome to our front. Doc, if you can hear me, I have a question. I'm not, Doc, can you hear me? Yes, okay, so if I'm able to raise him, I'll I think come back. I think it's muted. Uh, okay, yes. Um, it, it, if you can, if you can, 
Yes. Uh, Doc, if you can unmute, perhaps <laughs> you can help us with this yeah. particular question. <laughs> so I'm okay. moving out of the main spheres. Doc, can you briefly hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. So there's a question I have for you. If you have read what the Vice President said, or perhaps listened to him, do you think that he honestly analyzed the reasons that took us to the IMF? Because he divides them into two, external factors and the other two that were caused by his predecessors. Could he have said it better? Is this the perfect mode of communication that was used in delivering this particular message? All right, thank you. Um, I would like to extend my invitations to Honorable Setepe and my colleague, um, Eli. Um, I think that um, it's, it's, it's an issue of politics. So at a point in time, you know, your communication, you know, should be directed to capture uh, what you inherited and what you have done. And for me, I think that, that it's, it's well um, blame and respond. Uh, well, I'm afraid we haven't a sorry. We should be able to fix that so that I can hear him better on it. So um, the, the, we wanted to have some perspective for political marketing um, views too. But let me come back in studio. Yeah. So pushing in the direction that we find ourselves today, yeah. when you were talking about the other factors that come on board, mm -hmm. why do you think the vice president might have left out these other factors? Is it because you were not big issues and big contributors? I think they are. They are? Yeah. They are, they are big issues, they are big contributors, and it's important to, I don't know why he didn't mention them, but it's important to know that apart from these factors, there are other factors that have contributed to the current situation in which we are. Why is that important? Would it help us resolve it better or faster? Yes, it will. Okay, so even in our negotiations with the, the IMF, some of the things that we are negotiating on is how to increase revenues. Okay. Okay, and... One of the policies that the government implemented was the e-levy, and it, it didn't raise as much revenue as was anticipated. Mm -hmm. And some of us had mentioned that the design of the e-levy itself could have been better. And its current design has led to avoidance by, by let me say, the populace, because there's something that we refer to as a laugh effect. Okay? When you increase taxes, people will find will change their economic behavior, and that can reduce the revenue that you want to, mm -hmm. to generate. So for example, the e levy which was a major revenue, revenue item for the government, didn't materialize. And I think that one of the reasons is the way it was designed or implemented. OK, now that's interesting to note. Now, because this is also a politician speaking. Yes. When you hear, and I've seen some leaflet from the IMF also mentioning COVID and also the Russia-Ukraine war. Yeah. Much is not said about the other issues that actually mm -hmm. comes on board. Is it that you have a different perspective mm -hmm. of why we are where we are, mm -hmm. or we, politicians end up summing up and doing the blame around that? <laughs> okay, so yes, COVID, Russia are certainly factors. Uh, COVID-19 led to lockdowns, it affected supply chains, and the Russia-Ukraine war has led to increases in oil prices. Uh, commodities like wheat, etc., okay. prices have gone up. Okay, so certainly these are important factors. We cannot mm -hmm. ignore run them. Away, yeah. We cannot run away from them. But again, there are countries that have not gone to the IMF, even though these are global factors. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that means that our economy hasn't been resilient enough to absorb these global shocks. If we take other countries, they have been affected equally, but they haven't gone to the IMF. And these are because they have addressed structural issues. Uh, they, they have what it takes to absorb some of these shocks. For example, they may have high levels of reserves and can even intervene during, during a crisis. That's interesting. Yeah. Now, I'll take final words from you, Mr. Tekpe, on this point. Were you expecting the vice president to not say some of these things? In 2014, no, 2015 rather, when we actually went to the IMF, the vice president did a lecture about the uh, IMF program and the anchor holding or not holding. 
and ask whether would the anchor hold. He asked that politicians ought to be, the then government ought to be candid, apologize to the people, and get the people to come along. Do you think that's the kind of communication that's expected at this time going forward? Well, I, I was organizing, you know, media briefs, you know, from the, um, from the Ministry of Finance. And you recall, um, at the point, I was even said to be uh, too candid. But let me, let me just interject again uh, with information, uh, which, you know, could, could uh, sorry, help, you know, what the professors, you know, were, were, were saying. Um, if I may share quickly, I know I have a limited time. Yeah, I promise not to take too much of the time. Basically one uh, minute. <laughs> it, yes, it will, be, it will be less than one minute, please. Um, uh, you see this table after adjustments. Um, there are official IMF reports on Ghana, Article for 2019 and the RCF, the RCF is a COVID loop. And I've made some adjustments because there were some, you know, arithmetic errors. Now this is the point that's being made. In November, 2019, when Article 4 was released, and which is why it's important that we could, the IMF made a number of adjustments and the financing cap item five is there, 6.3%. By the time we went in for the COVID loan, it had risen to 7.4%. And you can see the measures that the government of Ghana said they were going to do. You can see World Bank emergency, IMF, uh, uh, COVID loan, uh, and then they were going to use the stabilization fund. In fact, you would even see in the details, I don't have the details here, gold monetization in Japan was there. Uh, there was a 1.4 uh, gap which was to be filled that 1.4 is exactly what is, uh, S, uh, how do you call it, uh, uh, Yee Levy was supposed to break. These were all there. So the vice president should have produced this table, you know, to, to show to Ghanaians. Um, this is our official document. You may download it, and I made some adjustments, as I said. You know, so, Remo, I think, you know, the lecture could have been a bit more candid because Ghanaians who are making this sacrifice, this is a government which also, I mentioned the sinking fund and the money they use. This is a government that has received six billion, and the World Bank has adjusted their figure to nine hundred million support already in support of COVID. One crisis, every government has gone through crisis from bushfires to you know uh, droughts to everything, right? Six billion, no government. This government actually received part of the ECF that we did because remember it overlapped. There were tranches. Mm -hmm. The last yeah. two tranches benefited this government, three oil fields, you know. So I would have expected an accountability from the vice president for all these things, contributions, you know, with Ghanaians, sacrifice with Ghanaians made, you know, in the presentation and then explain why all these benefits came in. In fact, the PRME is the counter cyclical policy which the professors are talking about because we have the stabilization fund, which is a buffer that we have always lacked. We have the sinking fund to attack, you know, our debt. Uh, the Ghana Infrastructure Investment Fund, which is to leverage an instrument for borrowing. And, and on. so the PRMA is structured. As I said, many of these funds are going to be zero in spite of, you know, all that, you know, uh, uh, the, the vice president. So I think it is incumbent on the government to be very candid. We are in a very dire situation. I get your we point. We are in a dire situation. And therefore, this is not the time with all due respect. And I was accused of being too technical and all that. So I can say for a fact that we should present the facts as uh, my president did in Sinch for the whole nation, for the professors and everybody we invited to be invited for us to do an analysis of some of the facts that we are presenting and his presentation so that the nation moves forward. This time, you know, for us, you know, to ignore 
okay. you know, certain facts and all that. Forgive me. They, they actually say I've run out of time. And I'm sure we can do this conversation into a detail form, a detailed uh, form in the future, Prof. Yeah. We should basically be going into what your machine has been telling us about in the future and other things in the future too. But for now, thank you so much for joining us, uh, Prof. Sir. Maybe just a last word before, or oh, we are out of time. Yeah, we are out of time. <laughs> Forgive me. We'll come back to this yeah. in the future. Thank you, folks, for joining us on today's Upfront.